listening to the Becoming Who You Are podcast, your guide to authentic living. Visit becomingwhoyouare.net for more resources, tools, and suggestions designed to help you create the life you want from the inside out. Now here's your host, Hannah. Hello, everybody. Whether you welcome to the Psychology Book Club, today we'll be talking about a book called Getting Real, 10 Truth Skills You Need to Live an Authentic Life by Susan Campbell, PhD. This is going to be quite a brief conversation today because I think everybody is out getting real. And so it's just going to be Jake and I having a quick chat about the book and our thoughts about it and any observations we had. So thank you for joining me today, Jake. Thank you. I really enjoyed this book. I got a lot out of reading it, and I thought the 10 truth skills that she highlighted were really, really valuable. But I'm also interested to know what you thought about it and whether you thought it was interesting and useful for you to read as well. I really like this book. I thought it was... um, I think it's one of the best ones we've done. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of it has been covered in other books that we've done in the Psychology Book Club. So... If you read this book, if you've heard us talk about some of the other psychology books, um, and if you've read psychology books in general, I don't. There's, it's not going to be a huge surprise what's in this book, um, but it's a really nice summary of all of the um, authenticity kind of concepts and um, approaches that. Um, that we've done in other books as well. And I, I there's nothing really in here that I disagreed with or thought was really problematic or something like that. No. Um, I also, I like the fact that it's a very actionable book. So it's done in a way that um, it's not like a, an intellectual discussion. It's here's stuff that you can do in your own life and that you can actually apply um, to live more authentically. Um, I th- it reminds me of Carl Rogers, um, the book on becoming a person that we did, mm. um, which also is a lot about um, letting go of being right and being, you know, just being real and being authentic. Um, but his books, he's more academic and his books are a lot more kind of discursive and so forth. This is very blunt and to the point mm. um, and it's really all about, OK, well, what can you do to be more real and more authentic? And I, I really liked it. Yeah, I really agree with what you've said. And one of the things that I think differentiates this book from other books that we've read is that although at a very basic level, a lot of the content is the same, um, the way that she sets it out is very clear. And like you said, it's very actionable. And what I what I really enjoyed about it is that there are definite things that I, I can think of now that... Um, I can definitely take away from it Mm. and I can start using today to make my interactions more authentic. And another thing that I really appreciated about it is it really highlighted to me um, how much more authentic my interactions can be. And I I think that's really, really important because, I mean, we've both read a lot of psychology books. We've both done a lot of self-work. And I think there is... I'm, I'm always quite careful to try to not fall into this trap but I think there is almost a complacency that you can develop when you've done that because I mean I I think our interactions are relatively authentic but again reading this book made me realise okay well I could be doing this differently and I could be doing this and that would help me get my need for authenticity met a lot more fully than it is right now yeah definitely yeah, it's uh, and it's also it's not done in a kind of um, judgy way or anything mm. like that. But it's just reading it, you do you realise um, what a struggle it is to remain authentic and how difficult to you know how easy it is to um, to get caught up in uh, in the scripts that we have and you know all the other things that pull us off the track from being really who we are. Absolutely, and she talks about some of the struggles that she's had herself, and even though she's been following the Getting Real program for many, many years, she still talks about how it's not so much a... um, 
it's not so much a destination that you get to a point where you are real and that's it, you're real now and all your interactions are getting real. The way that she describes it is it's like a process and it's a constant process that you have to be going through every time you have an interaction and constantly, um, I guess, questioning yourself and saying, is there a way that I could be being more authentic in this reaction? And uh, I mean, there's a there's a couple of bits in particular that I really like that I want to um, mm. get onto in a second. But I really like the fact that she highlights that you just need to be constantly aware of this and constantly aware of the things that might stop you from being your most authentic self in interactions. Yeah, and I feel like this book is something that um, the the fact that it's based on actionable things means that I know there's lots of stuff in here that I can incorporate into my kind of weekly routine if you like to try and keep be conscious of that yeah like, there's lots of things that she suggests that you can really use um which i'm sure we'll talk through when we talk through the, the, the sort of individual skills the truth skills as she calls them mm. but um it's definitely you know it doesn't leave it in it's not the kind of book which leaves it to you know one day you'll be enlightened if you only work on this long enough type of thing it's much more like here's what you need to do you know yeah. which uh, uh, you know there's a real value in that as well definitely um before we go any further maybe it would be helpful for people who are listening who haven't read the book if i just read through what the 10 truth skills are yeah go um for it. just so they have an idea of what we're actually talking about okay and if you want we can talk through one by one as well like what we thought about each of them yep okay so i'll i'll go through them all now i'll sure. go through each of the 10 and then we can talk through each one in turn and say a little bit more about it so these are the 10 truth skills Number one, experiencing what is. Number two, being transparent. Number three, noticing your intent. Number four, welcoming feedback. Number five, asserting what you want and don't want. Number six, taking back projections. Number seven, revising an earlier statement. Number eight, holding differences. Number nine, sharing mixed emotions, and number 10, embracing the silence. Okay, number one, experiencing what is. <laughs> this one was quite an interesting one, I thought. This definitely gave me a lot of food for thought. <laughs> I thought this was really helpful. Um, the thing that stands out for me, that what she says in that, is um, the thing about... Um, making a difference between what you're imagining so being clear in your own mind about what the difference between your internal imagining and ideation and what really is observable what's going on yeah so the way she talks about it is the difference between i notice and i imagine exactly so i notice that i feel angry sad elated joyful whatever and that's the objective Thing or feeling that is happening right now and then there's I imagine which is in a sense the projection or the conclusion or the assumption or the hypothesis that you have about what is going on yeah and I thought it was particularly useful when she talks about that and if you're in conflict with somebody mm. um, that you can if you're clear about like well I noticed um, that your face seemed quite tight and I imagine that you're very angry with me or something like that you know you yeah see. and the point being that when you say i imagine you're making it clear that that's something that you own in your head maybe you your imagination is uh true but maybe not because and she makes the point that you can't know what the other person is thinking or feeling you can only own your own imagination about it and in doing that you're not saying like you were really angry towards me and you you know you were really um you know, you were you were really offended by what I said or whatever. You you're you're making it clear that you're taking responsibility for your own internal imagination about what's going on. And in that way, the other person has the sort of space, um, as she puts it, to hear what your interpretation has been, but also to hear that you're aware it's your interpretation and you're open to you know, being wrong about it, basically. Yeah, and to hear that you're taking responsibility for it as well, which I think makes a huge difference on the part of the... Not only on the part of the person who's doing the speaking, but on the on the receiver end, on the part of the person who is hearing it. Um, certainly, it makes a huge difference to uh, hear the difference between... Um, 
you're just being irritating or whatever, yeah. <laughs> or you know, you you're just um, you're just getting angry, and um, I can see your face tightening up, but I imagine it's because you're getting angry. Yeah, and I liked it because I think it's also you know we from a lot of the psychology stuff that we've looked at. A lot of people talk about the you know the dangers of jumping to conclusions about somebody mm -hmm. and about making assumptions and so forth. But there's a bit of a bind, bind in there because you can get into a point where you're like, oh no, I shouldn't be making any assumptions or any conclusions. Yeah, yeah. You can really sort of, in a sense, start attacking yourself when ideas come up. And When well, actually the fact is that we all make assumptions. Of course, yeah. Because that's the way our brains work. If yeah. we feel something, we automatically want to fill in the gaps. It's just an evolutionary thing. We make stories on. about stuff. Exactly, and that's, that's our way of processing and understanding the world. So I, I completely agree with you, and I had the same thought when I was reading it, that actually this is probably one of the most useful approaches I've read to this, read about this, because, um, yeah, like you said, sometimes in these books, I mean, obviously... Acting on assumptions and acting on conclusions is probably not going to be very helpful. That's a different matter, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's what these other books are getting at, that quite often people act on these assumptions and conclusions when they're not correct. And that can be quite destructive to a, to a dialogue, and especially if you're in a conflict. Um, but at the same time, it's just not authentic to say, I feel angry but I don't know why. <laughs> you know, yeah, actually well, you yeah. do. Or to, or to just say, you know, I'm curious about the fact that your face was very tight and I have no idea what was going on there. And I'd yeah. love to hear more about it. That's not true, it's really. It's not authentic. It's not authentic. It's the, the, the authentic thing is, yeah, of course, you have an ideas come up like, wow, maybe she's angry, maybe she's upset, whatever. Maybe, maybe it was what I said earlier. Yeah. yeah. And, and so what I liked about this is it, you, it's, it's truthful and authentic, but it's also taking responsibility for the fact that you're aware that what goes on in your head and the ideas that you come up with are not the same thing as what reality is and that you're open to talking about that. And I thought that was great. Absolutely. And just to, just to follow up on that and as one last point, I think one of the things that I really like about it as well is that it allows both parties to know where they stand with the other person. So the person who is talking about what they notice and what they imagine, they can express what's going on for them in a truthful and authentic way. And equally, the other person then knows where they stand. They know what they notice. They know what they objectively saw. And they also know what's going on in their head as well. Whereas I think if you, if you just stick to feelings, like some approaches suggest, and just say, um, you know, I feel X, Y, Z, and the, the dialogue goes back and forth like that, I feel angry, well, now I feel angry to hear you say that or something like that, then... It's kind of tricky because you're in a very you're using a very rigid framework there, and consequently that means that both parties might not really end up knowing where the other person really stands. Mm. Yeah. Great. So the second one is being transparent. Mm. I thought this one was great as well. I particularly the thing. Um, uh, just to explain the uh, what she means by this, I think is basically. Um, expressing your feelings even when they're so-called negative feelings and um, in the interests of transparency which is one of the phrases that she suggests that you can use mm. that you especially in in you know romantic relationships and family relationships close relationships you know that a part of being real is just simply letting the other person know what is going on for you and what I thought was really really um also quite uh, liberating about this approach is that she actually talks about resentment mm. and resentment is one of those things that nobody wants to be resentful nobody wants to yeah, it's, a horrible feeling. it's a horrible <laughs> word as well it's horrible well. to feel it's like, and it's horrible to be on the receiving end of it right exactly <laughs> um, well, what I thought was really nice about this is that she um, she takes a lot of the power out of it mm. by basically saying look you're going to experience feelings and those feelings are going to include uh, appreciation and they're going to include resentment. Yes. And essentially... And you can feel both at the same you time. You can feel both at the same time and, you you know, essentially expressing them is more real, not because you want the other person to change and she's really clear about that, that this isn't about expressing your feelings so that you try and get the other person to stop doing the thing that makes mm. you feel resentful, whatever. 
the she and she talks about this in the other chapters too. But the the really key thing is, it's not with the purpose of uh, trying to change the person. It's just with the purpose of being real, of actually expressing yourself really. And, and I found it very helpful because I do um, experience resentment, mm. and I do judge myself negatively for it. Like, mm. oh, you know, I don't want to be a resentful person, and and. And, you know, I, I, I do want to resolve when I feel resentment, but I think the the point that she makes, which I guess I know deep down and we all sort of understand, but she just verbalizes it very well, is that by simply expressing what you're feeling, you know, you can express those feelings without that being something that the other person... You, without trying to get the other person to do something, without trying to manipulate them or something, and the other person can also accept your feelings without that necessarily being any kind of judgment on them. Um, it's just the first thing. It's just like, okay, this is this is I've had a feeling, and yeah. I'm going to be real about it. And she talks about it as well as being. These can be quite short interactions as well, which I thought was an interesting idea. That it's not necessarily wow. Now we're going to have like a major discussion about the fact that I felt resentment about something like that, that, that happened. She talks about it that part of the point is just being transparent. Yeah. It's just being honest. You know, what comes next is not necessarily, oh, now we've got to do something about it. We've got to act on this or whatever. It's like, a, it's just a fact of where you're at and that if you, if you're, real about where you're at with other people without any kind of judgment that they should then change or that there's some or without even necessarily knowing what's going to happen next that just puts you in a better place to to really uh yeah to really experience living as, as who you really are yeah and she, I, I agree with that and she actually talks about an exercise that um i've done myself in a workshop where you pair up and you can sit in silence for as long as you like if it's silence what comes up that's fine but each person takes turns reporting what they are feeling physically or emotionally in the moment Mm -hmm. so right now like i notice that i am feeling xyz or i notice that i'm feeling distracted and finding it hard to focus on this and it's a really really surprisingly powerful exercise because it i mean when i when i did it myself it started off with us both reporting that we were kind of distracted and noticing what else was going on in the room and everything but then it really quickly got very personal Mm. and you it's funny because it's very boundaried because you are just saying I noticed that I'm feeling you know or I'm noticing something about you like I'm noticing that you're looking at me very intently right now it's just whatever you're aware of in the moment Mm. and it it is so intimate it is surprisingly intimate but in a very safe way as well because it is so boundary because all you're doing is reporting what you're authentically feeling yeah it's it's a really i mean i I really recommend anyone listening um finding a partner that you trust and practicing that with them because it's it's a really powerful powerful exercise yeah was that part of your training when Mm -hmm. you were doing counseling training Yeah. yeah yeah that was one of the things that we did about um I think the context was just developing awareness in the moment. So that was an exercise used to illustrate how to practice kind of getting in touch with physically and emotionally where you're at, where your attention is at, where your thoughts are at. And also, I guess in a sense, practicing on listening to the other person as well, listening to where they're at and being able to hold your own thoughts and your own feelings and your own space while also receiving and listening, really listening to, actively listening to their thoughts and yeah. their feelings and what's going on for them as well. I think it's in this chapter. I don't remember if it's this chapter or another one because a lot of these also a lot of these kind of ideas overlap a bit. But um, I think it's in this one where she talks about the um, the kind of lure and uh, appeal that we all have towards projecting a positive image as yeah. opposed to being real and. I that. think she talks about it in the context of control, doesn't she? Because I think... Oh, the, maybe that's the next one, yeah. No, but I, I, I think it comes up in this one too because control is um, a recurring theme throughout this book. Yeah. And that was one of the things that really struck me, I think, because it made me realise just 
how much I have a tendency to try and control my interactions with other people and, frankly, how they perceive me as well. Yeah, how we all do. Yeah. Um, and it really, really made me aware of how powerful that is for me, that desire. And it's a safety thing. It's, mm. you know, I, I, it, it's born out of fear, I think. The fear of people's judgment, criticism, and rejection. Um, but this is the first chapter, I think, in which the control theme comes up. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, what, what that, you were talking about, I can definitely relate to that. In that sense, it's like trying to control your image in, in other people's eyes. Yeah, and, and trying to control them right, consequently the, as well. Kind of trying to control what they're going to give back to you. And essentially, I mean, this is not, again, it's not something that is going to be re- very sort of mind-blowingly new to people who've read some of the books that we've covered, but she's just making the point that if you can let go of that and just be real and allow other people to have whatever views they have of you, you know, if you express your real feelings and, you you know, you're transparent with them and also you do that without the expectation, oh, no, I don't want them to think this of me or I don't, I, I, it's important that they don't have this view of me or whatever, that you just let go of that and mm. just be transparent, then, you know, she's making the point that that is a... A, a way to gain real intimacy because you can really be yourself and other people can can have their own feelings about you whatever they're going to be you know which you don't control but you get to have the the real intimacy of being real yeah i think that's a great point that it allows you to be yourself and it allows other people to be themselves as exactly well. and it reminds me also of that article which i'm sure loads of people have seen because it's done the rounds on facebook and on loads of uh, social media sites about regrets of the dying Mm. and this is an article i'm sure if you if you look it up you'll find it um if you you google it but there was a i think it's called top five regrets top five regrets of dying or something like that it was and it was a nurse who worked in um palliative care or whatever it's called when you know with uh, people who who were dying and she wrote an article about what the things were when she asked people, you know, do you have any regrets or whatever, what they generally would say. And one of them, one of the top five regrets was, I wish I'd uh, expressed my feelings more. Yeah. And, or it's, I don't remember exactly how it's put, I wish I'd been truthful about my feelings or I wish I'd expressed my feelings. And that's really what this transparency chapter is about more than anything. It's it's about um, being transparent about what your real feelings are. And I think, that that regrets of the dying thing article made a big impression on me and on lots of people because when you read that you think right well you know I want to really make sure I can see if I can avoid ha- living my life in such a way where I have these regrets and I want to try and do whatever I can to be as conscious as possible about not living in a way that I end up having these regrets you know uh, maybe I'll have other regrets but I don't want to have the like the obvious ones and because um, I, I guess all the all a lot of the regrets were very much existential regrets yeah. as well. Really key, fundamental things that they Yeah, regretted. people people feeling like they hadn't really fully lived. And yeah. that's a terribly sad regret to have. And the, expressing your feelings is one of them. And I think, for me, this chapter uh, sort of reinvigorated my um, sense of uh, determination or consciousness um, about being very... Uh, very conscious as, as far as I can be to to be transparent. Yeah, because I think it's it's definitely one of those things that is much easier said than done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and although um, I know certainly my experience of reading this chapter was that I've read plenty of books before that talk about transparency and how great it is and how, you know, ideally if you want to be authentic, you need to be transparent. And I, I know that on a logical level, but when it actually comes down to it, it feels so risky it's a hugely vulnerable thing to do. And it feels, I mean, this sounds really dramatic, but sometimes for me anyway, when it it feels really high stakes. I mean, it feels like, you know, if I say this right now, my world could come crumbling down. And that's not objectively true, but that means that it it stops you from being yourself, really. It stops you from being transparent. That, That risk of... Um, feeling exposed, feeling rejected. Yeah. It's incredibly powerful. And she makes the point throughout this book that, look, we all feel that fear about being real, that it's going to have um, really negative consequences for us. And it totally makes sense because when we were kids 
and you know the world was populated by giants and gods of our parents and authority figures then um, we did pick up that very clear all of us picked up the message in various ways that we being real and being authentic uh, gets you in trouble and uh, leads to pain as a kid you know whether that's in terms of reprimand or other other experiences which are you know more dramatic examples of abuse and so forth but even just for normal quote normal parts of our culture where kids authentic expressions are kind of um, cramped mm -hmm. down and she's making the point all the way through the book that's why we feel that yes. fear but we're not small anymore we're adults now and we yeah. can survive the experience of somebody not liking what we say or we can survive the experience of you know, expressing our feelings and not getting what we want. And, and, and she's sort of, again, this is all, none of this is like rocket science, but I found it useful as a sort of affirmation to read that as a, as a kind of, in a sense, she's being empathetic about where these fears come from and mm. that from childhood, but also reminding us that, well, you know, yeah, we're adults now and we can take it. Absolutely, and I was just thinking as you were saying that there is a, this is the first time I realised this, but there is definitely a um, parallel between that and the, what she says in the first chapter. This idea of noticing what is objectively there, what is objectively the situation, what is objectively happening, and what we imagine, and how sometimes right. there can be such a huge difference. I mean, it feels so real to us from in the moment, but there can actually be such a huge difference between what is objectively true and what is going on in our minds. And I think that's the same here, that we have this huge fear. It feels so risky to be vulnerable and to be transparent, yet objectively, as you said, you know, we're all adults now, and really what is the worst that is going to happen? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Did you have anything else that you wanted to say about that? Not on that chapter, no, I think that's certainly. Okay, so number three, this is one of my favourite chapters, I think. This is Noticing Your Intent, and I think this is a really, really interesting one. Um, because, again, it goes back to control, and like I said earlier, this is one of the things that really hit home for me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think um, some of the things that I was thinking about this chapter, I actually said about the previous one, because she talks about um, the idea of relating, not controlling, being just to say something with the purpose of being expressive of who you really are and what you really feel, as opposed to with the purpose of trying to get the other person to do something or change. Or to, yeah, or to change the outcome of or the change situation. change the outcome. Or, yeah, and also to be uh, able to live with the idea that you're going to relate something, you're going to tell someone what you think and how you feel, and you're not going to know what that's going to lead to. And, you know, the, the control game is really like, okay, I want this outcome, so I'm going to say this, and mm -hmm. then I anticipate the other person's going to say that, and I'm going to try and steer this conversation towards my goal or my end. And she's making the point that, that that's all about control as opposed to relating, which is just, I'm going to say this because it's what's real for me, and it's because it's what I feel and what I think right now, and I don't know where that is going to take us in our relationship or in our business deal or in our whatever it is, right? Mm. And that's interesting because she's saying, like, you're throwing yourself into the unknown with the other person, but in doing so, you actually get to really live, to really experience, like, yeah, the, the true, your true self and, and expressing your true self um, without trying to control what that's going to do. Yeah, and that's something that she actually comes back to in, I think, Truth Skill number 10, um, so we can talk more about that then. I just wanted to actually read out. I've got the, um, at the beginning of the book, she summarizes all of the truth yeah, skills. Definitely. So I just wanted to read out the summary for noticing your intent. Just because I think out of all the truth skills as well, this is probably the hardest one to be aware of, self-aware of in the moment. Because all the others, like you said, everything is very actionable. Um, but a lot of the other... Oh, m not all of them, but the majority of the other um, truth skills are more about how you communicate, whereas this one is very much an internal process. So I think it's perhaps one of the more challenging true skills to live. So I just wanted to read the summary out. Number three, noticing your intent. Communicating with the intent to control the outcome of a situation represents the ego mind's efforts to protect you. The intent to control or to self-protect does have its place, especially if you're in physical danger. 
However, most people communicate with the intent to control rather than to relate far more than they need to. If you really want to see the reality of a situation or to connect with someone emotionally, you need to allow yourself to be open to the possibilities of each moment, spontaneous and unrehearsed. You need to relate more and control less. Mm, yeah. I remember she uses an example about control where she says, look, if you're the captain of a ship and there's a storm, yeah, you're going to need to bark some orders. Uh, you know, you've got to get the sails in order and, and you've got to, I don't know, don't really, don't really know anything about sailing a boat, but you've... Big you, stuff. <laughs> yeah, you've got to do the rigging thing and all of that stuff. And so she makes the point that, yeah, of course there are going to be circumstances where you're not going to be wandering around the boat like, so, you know, I'm feeling concerned about this enormous wave, whatever. You know, you're going to be doing a control type um, uh, interaction and your intention is going to be very clearly to get get shit done, basically. Yeah. Um, and but she makes So she makes the point, it's not that there's anything wrong with control per se it's totally appropriate for some circumstances but we've all become so addicted to it that we use we're sort of like really overusing it and we're using it in circumstances where it's really not necessary and therefore it's getting in the way of our genuine uh, interaction yeah again going back to what we were talking about before we've become overprotective of ourselves yeah exactly behaving as if we are the captain of a ship in the storm yeah. when we're just a couple of people having a chat, you know. Yeah. I think um, the, other, the other things that I had to sort of, that, that I thought about this one really more, I said in, in the previous one, to do with the idea of uh, relating, not controlling. What impressed me was that idea of saying what you feel without knowing what the other person is going to do or how they're going to react. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and that's something that, again, is uh, I think I need to consciously remind myself about not getting caught in that control paradigm. Yeah, definitely. Okay, number four was welcoming feedback. Mm. I, yeah, I really like this chapter too. The thing that really stood out for me is that um, do you want to read out the, uh, the definition thing? yeah maybe that would be yeah. helpful from now on yeah. okay welcoming feedback is another way to be present to what is it means being attuned to what is happening around you each moment when you welcome feedback you are actively curious about how others are affected by your actions you ask how are you with what, I'm just, with what I just did or what is your response to what I'm saying Asking for feedback keeps the two-way flow of conversation going, an essential ingredient of relating. The ability to notice others' verbal and non-verbal feedback is how you learn from experience. You do or say something, then you notice what happens. In this way, you can, in this way, sorry, you can see whether your behaviour serves your needs, aims, and values. Mm -hmm. Again, I found this to be quite a humbling uh, mm. chapter to read because I do value feedback and my values, right? I do think feedback is a great thing and I think it's an important thing and everything else. But reading it, if I'm honest with myself, I also realise that it's, I find it very hard to genuinely ask for feedback when I'm not really asking for reassurance or mm. I'm not really asking for praise or you know, uh, validation or something like that. And also, even though I really value feedback, um, she says, you know, you, maybe you even you think feedback's a good thing, but do you really get a lot of feedback from other people? And, you know, if you don't, maybe it's because people don't think that you're necessarily that open to it. Now, yeah, I, you're I, sending out a message. Yeah, and I, I mean, like, I don't think that I'm sort of... I know that I don't sort of jump on people who give me feedback, but the fact is, I feel like I could be more open to the genuine, non-controlling openness to feedback that she talks about, where mm. you ask for feedback because you're genuinely curious and interested, whatever the outcome is, not because you want reassurance or praise mm. or confirmation, and not only when hey, I've just done a really great thing. Do you have any feedback for me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because that's like, everyone wants feedback at that point. Like, hey, uh, so uh, can you give me some feedback now that I've just been a really awesome person and done something, you know, very generous or whatever it is, right? I think it's, it's more about getting feedback when you 
you're open to it being whatever it is, right? And that the idea that that's helpful, um, and that that's um, that allows you to to be more real in your relationships as well. Absolutely, and I can, I, on a personal level, I can definitely relate to asking for feedback when actually what I want is your assurance. Um, I've had this, I mean, we've had this a number of times mm. where I've asked you for feedback about something, and logically, on a thinking level, I think, yeah, I really, you know, I really want genuine feedback about this, um, you know, whatever it might be. And, but actually, <laughs> what's really going on is I want feedback as long as it's not negative. <laughs> and so when, you know, if you have any comments or anything which are always really helpful and constructive, um, even though I do appreciate it and I do welcome it on a certain level, it still kind of sucks because it's like, oh, well, actually, you know, I realised then what I really wanted was reassurance. But then again, I do also think it is possible, like when she talks about this, we can come on to this when she talks about this um, in, in the other um, truth skill, but I do think it's possible to appreciate feedback and for it still to suck. Yes, <laughs> you know, it's the yeah, it's, uh, exactly. It's this thing that um, you know we were talking about it this morning. That um, I was, I remember saying to you, we were talking about a, a technical problem, and I remember saying to you, if I had a technical problem with my website, mm. I'd want a friend to tell me about it. Mm. But it would still suck to know that I had a technical problem. You know, I'd want to know. Yeah. But if I'd made a kind of big blunder or something uh, on my website, I'd want to be told, but I, it would still also, I wouldn't feel happy, or, you know, yeah. it'd be painful to know, but I'd, actually I shouldn't use the word but, because she said it's and, <laughs> and I'd want to know. So it's both at the same time, I'd appreciate it, and I would also find it difficult to hear. Yeah. And I, so I, I get where you're coming from, but I just wanted to, to say that reminds me of that later, later um, thing. But the thing that really stuck out for me is, um, yeah, feedback is, it's hard to be genuine about. And again, it's, it goes back to the previous chapter about noticing your intent. When you yeah. ask for feedback, would it actually be more authentic and more upfront to say, I really feel like I need some reassurance? Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And that's, that would be... Because feedback is hard. I yeah. mean, it's really, really hard. And it's also, you know, it, it could be... I want feedback, and I feel afraid to receive it. Yes, yeah. and and I don't know if I can receive it right now. I mean, that's all. And I have a desire to control the situation. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, <know>. exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and, and it, you feel immediately in sort of talking about those things at the same time. You feel it's such a weight off to be able to yeah. acknowledge that. Yeah, it's okay to say I do want feedback, and at the same time. I'm not sure if I do really want to. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think that's one of the things that I really took away from this book, actually, overall, is that the prospect of being truly authentic with someone is very, very scary. And that's often what stops people, is this fear of vulnerability that I was talking about earlier, this fear of being exposed and all the things that come with that, so potentially being rejected. But actually, carrying that fear around is so much more of a... A kind of emotional or personal jail sentence than mm. taking that risk and being authentic. Like you said, it's hugely liberating to be able to say, this is what I'm feeling right now. This is who I am right now in this very moment. It might change in 30 seconds. It might change sooner. <laughs> but this is what's going on for me right now. Mm. Absolutely. Cool. Number five was asserting what you want and don't want. So the summary for this is asserting what you want affirms your right to want what you want, even if you imagine it's an unreasonable demand or there's little chance of getting it. This skill also helps you become less attached to getting everything you ask for since each request won't carry, carry such a heavy load. When you're free and fluent with your requests, you don't expect to get everything you ask for. But when you save up your requests for the really important things, each request carries more significance than is realistic. Asking freely instead of inhibiting yourself keeps your energy flowing. You are saying yes to yourself, no matter how another person responds to your wants. It's also very important to let people know about what you don't want. You need to be able to refuse to do, receive, tolerate, or speak about something if that is your honest response. 
This kind of asserting may result in the other person being disappointed, frustrated, or angry. But if a relationship is to be authentic, there needs to be space for people to experience their full range of feelings and to have those feelings be okay. Yeah. I another chapter that I really really liked, and um, mm. it reminds me of it reminds me of um, that there's, there's sort of two approaches. There's the approach which is the um, that phrase like pick your battles, mm. and she's providing a different approach because the sort of pick your battles approach uh, is like okay, I'm going to be. I'm not really going to ask for things or say I want things or uh, like I'm going to basically let loads of things just slide and I'm going to really focus on the things that I really want. Mm. And she makes the point, if you do that, you're so invested in those few things that you've decided to actually express your wants about that, you know, if you don't get them, it's like a catastrophe. Mm. Whereas her approach is to just separate your wants from any expectation about whether or not you're going to get anything mm. and just be honest about like I want this I want that I don't want this I don't want that and whether or not any of those things are going to come true is a completely different matter I, yeah again you're not doing it with the intent to change someone's actions or change them or change the situation you're simply saying this is what's going on for me right now yeah exactly and I thought that was great because I think that's, again, a very liberating thing to just be honest with yourself and with your relationships with your people in, close to you in your life um, about what your desires and, uh, and wishes and, uh, and things that you don't want are. And then what other people make of that is a totally separate question. Mm. And it's open, that's all up for grabs, you know. But all you're doing is being true to your expression of yourself. Yeah. And In a way, what she's saying is it's not your problem what other people think. It's not your responsibility to manage them. All you can do is be responsible for expressing yourself as you are right now in this moment. Mm. And I think it goes for on the listening side as well that I think it's another thing that I am aware of the need to stay conscious about is hearing what somebody else wants and doesn't want is you, know, you can accept that and you can uh, acknowledge and give them the space to have their wants and don't wants and that's not the same thing as you agreeing to change your behaviour or, or to facilitate something or whatever, that's a different question but there's no obligation right. to meet their needs or right, exactly. preferences or whatever. But I think there is an obligation in, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna relate to each other truthfully, there is an obligation to accept the other person's wants and don't wants as being real, right? Whether or not what the action is is separate, but I think we have to accept our desires yeah. and of each other, and in order to really, uh, and that that's what I think it means to really accept someone is to accept that they, they have their, their own desires and their own wants and their own not wants. Um, and then you have to, you know, then it's a separate conversation as to what you're both going to do about that. Yeah, and really I think what's the essence of that is boundaries and being able to not only assert what you do want, but also what you don't. And again, regardless of how other people are going to react. Um, so... I want X, Y, Z, or I don't want X, Y, Z, and express that, and but very much viewing your your wants, your needs as separate from the other person's, not intertwined. Yeah. Did you have anything else that you wanted to say about that? No. Okay. Number six, taking back projections. So this is what the summary is for this section. Often what you, quote, see in another person is actually a mirror of something in yourself that you're uncomfortable with. When a timid person is put off by someone aggressive, perhaps she is disowning her own aggressiveness, that is, her ability to stand up for herself. When a dominating person is bothered by a timid, fearful person, perhaps he's not acknowledging his own fearfulness. The phenomenon of projection has been recognised since ancient times. In the Sermon on the Mount in the Bible, Christ urged his followers to be mindful of noticing the speck in their neighbor's eye while failing to notice the log in their own. 
Becoming aware of projections helps you to season your judgments with some humility. It can also help you to remember that other people's judgments about you are as much, brackets or more, about them as they are about you. And perhaps most important, this kind of awareness can show you where your life energy is blocked or stuck in a pattern so that you can get it flowing again. Mm. Yeah, this is quite a relevant chapter I thought for me, certainly. Um, I mean, it really, again, it's, this is all stuff I know on a conscious level or an intellectual level. It's all stuff that I've read about before, that I've talked about before, that I've learned about before. But it was a really helpful reminder of how I definitely project stuff onto people sometimes. And I think the part about um, disowning parts of yourself. So, for example, um, something that I really struggle with in other people is helplessness. When people, especially when I talk to people who are trapped or feel trapped in this cycle of helplessness, and for example, they do the yes but game um, from transaction analysis. Mm. So you'll keep making suggestions to them, um, and they'll say, Yeah, but I can't do it because of X, Y, Z. Mm. And you'll say, Okay, well, how about ABC? And they'll mm. say, Yeah, but I can't do it because of you know, whatever. And and it's really frustrating, and essentially what they're doing is transferring their feeling of helplessness onto you there. And I I definitely know that I get drawn into that game because, um, well, I guess for a couple of, there's a couple of things that come up for me about it. First of all, that the essence of that, that game is not so much to offer practical solutions, but just to meet them where they are, to say, to say you know, I, I can... I imagine that you're feeling. I noticed that you're <laughs> you're you're looking this way, or you're saying this, or whatever. And I imagine that you're feeling quite helpless. Mm. And to meet them, to kind of see them as they are, instead of trying to fix them, essentially. Um, but I think the reason that I, I tend to get sucked into that game is because it's quite. It was a condition of work for me to be very independent and self-sufficient and it's definitely a part of my self-concept that I still struggle with now and that's you know talking about controlling how people perceive you I really like to be seen as an independent person that doesn't need any help and doesn't need any you know support or anything I'll be fine and the result of that is that of course I have a part of me that definitely feels very helpless sometimes and I disown that part Mm. Um, it provokes a lot of internal criticism for me when I feel helpless and it's kind of a vicious cycle. And so this this uh, chapter really um, brought that up to my awareness, definitely. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. I, I do. I also found it to be a really helpful chapter. And I think it's it's one of those things that, like most of, well, like the whole book really, she's really focusing on you maintaining the locus of control and the, the locus of responsibility in yourself rather than projecting it out of out into mm. the outside world so what i mean by that is whatever problems you're having with other people in your life or relationships this chapter is about rather than essentially blaming them it's about looking at your own, getting your own house in order, basically, isn't it? It's about yeah, looking at... Yeah, I think at she makes the point that... For, I mean, she, one of the examples that she uses is when people say, you made me feel this way. And, um, again, this is an idea that we've talked about, I think, more than once in the book club before, but it's this idea that, no, no one can make you feel a certain way. You have to, you know, in a sense, you have to take ownership for your own feelings. But while you're focusing on them... You can't do that. You can't look after yourself. And you can't really be authentic about what's going on for you because while your awareness is focused outwards, um, you can't be... It can't be focused inwards. Yeah. I don't think I had anything really more specific to say about this chapter, but I did find it very helpful. And I I think the thing that stuck with me was just that idea that whatever conflict um, I get into and whatever anger or frustration I have towards anyone else you have to stop and think what is what button is being pressed for me here that is to do with stuff that I am having difficulty accepting about myself and that is coming out as you know that person's 
doing X, Y, and Z when actually it's because, as you say, there's a part of oneself that you find it difficult to accept. And uh, and I think it's a really, really helpful thing to do to to try and try and evaluate that. Again, I think this is one of those chapters that's quite easy to explain in. Um, no literal terms but actually when it comes down to doing it it's one of the more challenging truth skills because it really requires you to look immerse and just constantly be aware of what's going on with your own internal process it's less about how you're communicating with the outside world but it's it really starts with what's going on inside for you and yeah again I, I mean I don't really have any more comments about this chapter but just I think it more hit me on a personal level and really um, reminded me how important it is to be aware of how does this relate to me? Is this something that I struggle with within myself? And I think the, the difficult thing about projections is that they can be so invisible that in a sense, like when you feel a lot of frustration and anger towards someone else, it's so easy to blame that other person without and be completely oblivious to the button that's getting pressed in yourself yeah, absolutely. Because with the helplessness, for example, if someone was doing the yes but game with me and I was engaging with it, if I realised that, my temptation is to turn around and say, well, they weren't being transparent with me. Mm. When actually, I'm sure that a lot of the um, annoyance and kind of exasperation that I feel is not about them. Because I, I mean, I know that I am usually quite a compassionate person and I, I am able to empathise with people, but there are just certain hot buttons for me that I there are real blocks to empathy yeah. and it's it's not about their lack of transparency or anything but it's so tempting that, you know even though it's about me it's so tempting <laughs> to blame well, also because there can be good reasons to feel annoyed with other people and at the same time there can be projection going on as well and so that's yeah, again it's holding them exclamations yeah, right <laughs> that's where it gets really complicated because they can you know they it, it's quite easy to find like a very reasonable reason to get upset with someone and then through that to not be aware of the additional weight that's there because you're projecting to your your own stuff's coming out in it at the same time you know you can try and be aware of all of your um, projections uh, but you can still acknowledge that also something happened that was upsetting for you and that you think you understand why that was upsetting as well as you know so it's not like saying you know you have to walk through the earth like jesus like the you know oh cast your stones at me type of thing you know it's only ever my fault it's in a sense like it's a question of taking responsibility for what it is that you're putting out there even if other people are also doing things that upset you for if you like non-historical reasons there's still a responsibility to take in terms of being conscious of your own uh, stuff that you're putting out there yeah and i i mean just to follow on from that I think one of the things that I personally struggle with is when I realise I'm doing something like that and I'm projecting on people I start thinking well I shouldn't be feeling annoyed yeah and one of the things that I appreciated about what she writes is that she just leaves that completely out of it and she I don't even think she really talks about it but the message that I get from this is it's not about what you should or shouldn't be feeling but it's about being aware I mean it's it's like um, I was listening to this really interesting book called Situations Matter recently and that's all about context and one of the points that the author of that book brings up, I think his name is Sam Summers, is that it's um, when people have biases about things, so for example racial biases or cultural biases, when you're aware of that bias, um, it's far, far less powerful. So another example he uses is... um, I've forgotten what the technical term for it is, but for example, if you see someone lying on the street and you're in, a, you're in a crowd of people and no one's going to help them, you're far less likely to go and help them unless you're aware of that bias within yourself to want to blend into the crowd, in which case it becomes nullified. Right. And you'll be aware of that and you'll be the first person to go and help them, if that makes sense. Um, and I, I think it's the same for projections. You know, It's not about you should or shouldn't be feeling a certain way. It's just about being aware of it and, again, noticing it. Yeah, and even expressing that thing, I noticed that I'm projecting my own disowning of my helplessness onto you, or whatever. You know, it's it's about just just noticing and not judging either yourself or other people. Mm-hmm. Cool. Did you want to say anything else about that? 
key. Number seven, revising an earlier statement. Yeah, really great, great chapter again. Um, it's okay, it's okay to be human. <laughs> yeah, and, and this is something that um, I, I really, really value this because um, I think... Oh, do you, do you want to Shall read the thing? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. We can learn to be flexible enough to change our minds and to let someone know that our feelings have changed. You may at times notice that you no longer feel something after you've expressed it. That's kind of what I was just talking about. You may realize hours or days after you shared something that it was a lie, or you may discover a deeper level of your feelings. In such, in such situations, it's important to give yourself permission to come back to the person with whom you've communicated to clear things up. Also known as, quote, going out and coming in again, this truth skill can help you deal with changing your mind, clearing up a misunderstanding, or making up after an argument. It gives you a way to continually forgive, brackets, or seek forgiveness, and begin again. Yeah, and for me, this really is about, if you get into a conversation where um, you're both getting defensive and you're both finding yourself getting a bit triggered... Um, you know, we've we've had this before, where you know we've basically said, "Can we just start again?" Yeah. And I find that incredibly helpful because otherwise, I think, the, especially if I've become defensive, then there's, you, I can just get more and more entrenched, you know, in in the defensiveness. Yeah. Unless you have to kind of reboot and actually sort of realize, okay, wait a minute, this is this is, I, I am getting defensive and not communicating what I genuinely think and feel here and the the opportunity to acknowledge that a conversation that you that you have gone off the rails a bit in terms of what it is that you're trying to communicate or the conversation where you're trying to be authentic isn't being authentic and to say you know cut <laughs> let's press the reset button <laughs> let's, let's yeah let's restart let's try that again uh, is is really really valuable and um it's certainly something that i feel um i need to be authentic because i can get into a situation where i find myself becoming um un unauthentic inauthentic in the way that i'm expressing myself and the only way to really do that is to say wait a minute i'm not being authentic let's Let's, yeah. let's start this again. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I appreciate using that example because I think that shows how it can be really useful in conflict, for example. Um, I really like the example that she used as well, which um, I, I can't remember names, but let's just say Bob and Sally. Um, Bob and Sally are out on the first date and Bob says, you know, how are you, what are you thinking right now? And what Sally's thinking is, I'm wildly attracted to you. Mm. Or, oh no, he says, what do you think of me? Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. He basically asks for feedback. And she's thinking, I'm wildly attracted to you. And she says, oh, you know, I think you're very nice. And she goes home, she's thinking about it. She's like, damn, you know, I should have <laughs> yeah. said that. So she calls him the next day and says, you know, or says, when you said that to me, uh, when you asked me that question last night, I responded with, I think you're nice, but I'd like to revisit that question next time we meet up. Or she calls him and says, you know, I said this, but what I was actually thinking was this. Yeah, like I was a bit surprised by a question and I kind of went on to autopilot, but what I really want to tell you is that I'm wildly attracted to you. Yeah. And yeah, and that, and, and she makes the point actually in that chapter, like, do you think he would think any less of her for saying this? Yeah. And, and you, you know, you, of course, everyone reading it, it's like, no, he's going to think she's great, you know, because she's, she's been open with him and, and there's a, a vulnerability in um, in admitting that, and she talks about that with regard to lying as well. Yeah, which I, I thought was yeah, also she's the example of the workplace conflict where someone had lied about something that was their responsibility, a mistake that they had made, and everyone knew that this person was responsible, but mm. they kept meaning. I think he damaged some equipment, and he kept maintaining it was a manufacturing error, and everyone knew that he was responsible. And yeah. He, when he came clean, um, the situation was resolved very quickly, whereas if he hadn't come clean, he probably would have gotten fired. Yeah. And I thought it was... What I liked about it is she was saying, like... This is totally paraphrasing her, but she's basically saying, look, everyone lies. You're going to get into a situation where you're not going to be 100% truthful. Mm. And it's best to 
come clean, basically. And, and you know, when, it, yeah, exactly. And the point being that if you hold honesty as a virtue, um, then if you find yourself not really being honest, then you're in this conflict. Like, hey, you know, I, I hold honesty as a virtue and I just said something that isn't really truthful. Um, even if we're talking about a quote, white lie or whatever it or is. a quote, good lie is, for yeah. example, in the case of Sally and Bob, you know, if it's just that she wasn't as openly and as enthusiastic about right. him, you know, exactly. it, it's not a lie as we would traditionally think about it or conventionally think about it, but it's still not the truth in the context of really being authentically truthful. And uh, what I got from the way that this uh, author writes is just like, look, you know, let's stop all stop holding ourselves so seriously and just basically come clean you know and they, in other words stop making such a big deal about whether or not you have uh acted against your values and just correct it as yeah. soon as possible um because that is like we all make mistakes in terms of living our values the question is whether or not you are willing to address that and to actually then as she puts it, go out and come in again. Because in a sense, if you hold that as your standard, then it gives you the opportunity to be a fallible person that makes mistakes, but also not get, not compound them by like, oh, well, now I don't, you know, I, I haven't been really 100% truthful, but I don't want to say anything because I don't want anyone to know that I haven't been 100% truthful because then they'll think that I'm not 100%, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what I really like about it is, I mean, obviously, if, you, if you've lied about something, the person who you've lied to is probably not going to be pleased about it. And there might be some, you know, potentially serious repercussions to come from it. But ultimately, having this approach and being able to, she says, go out and come back in again, it, ta- it really takes the pressure off you because you don't have to live up to this unobtainable standard and kind of suffer the internal punishment that inevitably comes from breaking that standard afterwards. I think that's exactly what I was trying to say. Yeah, that's very well put. That's basically what I took from it. From yeah. Great. Should we move on? Mm. Okay, number eight is holding differences. Holding differences refers to your ability to have your own viewpoint while at the same time being open to hearing and considering different views. Openly listening to opposing views need not interfere with your ability to know what you think or feel about the matter. Holding differences helps you handle more complexity. You think in terms of both and, of both slash and, not either slash or. This practice helps you see the relationships between things that may appear separate or mutually exclusive. As a result, you become much more effective in situations involving conflict negotiation, group decision making and problem solving. It enables you to experience the principle of mutual benefit in your relationships, the fact that any action that harms a part harms the whole, and that any action that heals the collective heals the individual. I'm not going too far out on a limb to say that world peace might actually be possible if everyone on Earth Earth mastered this truth skill. I'm laughing because there has been a bit of a pattern in these books where one of the last chapters is, and now here's how you use this to save the world. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Definite pattern. (laughs) It's either, um, it either turns into God or it turns into how to save the world. But, you know... (laughs) Fair enough, at least it's it's a good goal. It's a nice aspiration, Yeah. yeah. I hadn't noticed that before, which is like, call me Bill. <laughs> um, yeah, I really like this chapter. And again, what really struck me about it is that it's, um, it's about boundaries and it's about being able to have connection with someone um, and a really intimate connection, you know, the kind of most intimate connection you could have, but also being very separate from them, very individuated from them at the same time. Um, and again, that was one of the probably one of the most valuable things I learned when I was doing my counselling training was this idea, um, you know, that um, exercise that I was describing earlier. Mm-hmm. It's this idea that you're you're able to have an, you know, one of the most intimate connections you've ever had with anyone, and be really truly connected to them. But you can only do that when you have your own boundaries and when you are a separate person. You have your separate thoughts, feelings, um, needs, desires. And you respect their thoughts, feelings, needs, and desires as a separate person as well. Mm. 
And that's what, I mean, that's what really strikes me about this. And also how hard it is to do, frankly, as well, because I know definitely that I, um, especially if I'm in disagreement with someone about something, if I find out that they have a different opinion to me, um, I, and, and not, you know, I prefer vanilla ice cream, oh, I prefer chocolate. You know, it's like if we're actually having a, a disagreement about a situation or a perception of a situation or a personal, you know, whatever, um, I, it, it definitely makes me question myself if someone has a different opinion to me about it. Mm. Yeah, I th- like I, I liked it. It's in a sense, it feels like a lot of the things um, in this chapter for me were we've probably talked about mm. from previous ones. There is a funny bit in this chapter where she talks about going away to a retreat. And oh, yeah. the meditating and stuff. Anyway, if you read the book, you'll see it's it's not very important. But I I found that a bit weird. I, yeah, I've got to say that's the one thing um, that I I wasn't quite on board with this, with this book was that I, I mean it's kind of strange to read it because, like we were saying at the beginning, a lot of her suggestions are just so down to earth mm. and so based in reality. And she also obviously really prizes reality and talking about what is. Mm. But then she also talks about universal energy and the yeah. the retreat thing and you know you're blocking if you're holding on to um unresolved issues you're blocking your life energy and stuff like that and but i think it's a small it doesn't oh, it yeah, doesn't really throw the book and and she mentions those kinds of things a few times but frankly you can just ignore the stuff that sounds a bit woo woo and it doesn't make any difference to the main the main value of the book it's, it's i think i bring it up because with the retreat example um I wasn't quite sure why she included that. No, it didn't I'm, I'm not sure either. It was. It I think it was. To, it, you'll, if you read the book, you'll see there's an odd example that she gives about this idea of holding differences. Um, but it's too, it's a long, complicated story to go into, and frankly, it doesn't really. It didn't really do much for me. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the it's the the thing. Another thing that she talks about in this chapter is active listening and just being able to listen to somebody who has a different view than you without jumping all over it but just like basically taking it in yeah. and then being able to listen uh, to see where that takes you while holding on to your own perception yeah absolutely yeah cool that's all i had to say about that yeah me too okay number nine sharing mixed emotions this is something that we've referred to a couple of times already but i'll just read out the summary of it when you're ambivalent confused or quote of two minds go ahead and express this fact you may be pulled equally in two or more directions, or you may feel primarily one way, brackets, in your foreground, but have a background feeling that's different. The ability to express complex feelings is especially useful when you're angry about what someone did, but also appreciate the person's good intentions or when you want to express a strong... Sorry, but also appreciate the person's good intentions or when you want to express a strong feeling to clear up unfinished business, but at the same time feel concerned about the other person's reaction. It's okay to be both angry and afraid, both resentful and appreciative, both eager and reluctant. This skill teaches you to let go of your ideas and shoulds about being consistent so that you can experience whatever shows up in your awareness. Um, At risk of sounding like a broken record, again, I really like this chapter. Mm. And um, one of the things I really like about it is something that we've already touched on a little bit, but that feeling of liberation of just being able to say, this is what's going on for me. This is who I am right now. And um, we we actually had this earlier, didn't we? When we were talking about something, and I, I can't remember what it was now, but I was able to say I feel both A and B about it, and they were two ostensibly conflicting emotions, but I felt them both together. Mm-hmm. So they were real, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, I really like it, I too. I found it very helpful, and I think it's... There's another thing that stuck out, that st- stood out for me, was she said something in here which... I thought, you know, she's, she kind of likes to give the reader a little push sometimes as well. And she says something about, like, don't cop out. Don't say you just you don't know how you feel, because that's actually a cop out. Normally that's like hiding the fact that you feel lots of different stuff, mm-hmm. which may not make sense, mm-hmm. right? And she says, like, don't worry about it if it doesn't make sense to you. Just express the first thing that comes up, and then you're totally at liberty to say... And I also feel 
something else, which seems to be in complete contradiction to it. But so she's well, to go out and come back in again and say, actually, yeah. no, now I think about it, or now I get in touch with that. I don't feel this. I yeah. actually feel this. Yeah. And she's sort of the point she's making is like, just keep the flow going. Just be real. Be expressive. And um, and I, I, like I don't think she's saying like you must always know exactly what you think and feel about everything because I, I didn't take it in that sense. Obviously, there are times when you just don't know, but I took it in the sense of like don't try and hide behind not not knowing. It's it's better to express yeah. stuff even if it sounds like it's confused or ambivalent to you. Again, um, it's like not trying to control. Yeah. Things. Yeah. Exactly. And um, so yeah, I thought that was great and uh, and. I think it's definitely true in my experience that the richest and deepest emotional experiences that I've had in my life have been when I've felt a lot of different things at the same time. Yeah. You know, I think it is possible to to have experiences where you feel three or four emotions at the same time. And even ones that seem to be completely in conflict with each other, like feeling happy and feeling sad... Yeah. And um, feeling uh, some sadness, but also some relief, and feeling obviously like feeling anger, angry and sad at the same time is maybe a little bit more common and stuff. But there's there's so many ways in which you can feel more than one thing at the same time, and it's not that's not confusion, that's richness. Well, it's being alive, and I mean, I'm just thinking about it now, and I'm thinking, you know, I don't. I think the times when we do feel two, three, four, or more emotions are far more common than when we just feel one thing. And yeah. I think quite often we we say, oh, I'm feeling sad right now, or I'm feeling happy right now, or I'm feeling relieved, or but actually there's, there's a whole experience going on under the surface that we're not expressing by just naming that one emotion. Yeah, and in some senses, it's also when she talks about you can experience resentment and appreciation at the same time as well. Like yeah. those aren't exactly the same as sort of like the more basic feelings, but they seem to be contradictory. But actually, you can experience those two yeah. at the same time. Absolutely. Number ten. This is probably my favourite because um, it's again it taught me a lot about myself. Um, in fact, I might have said that number three was my favourite. They're both my favourite. I'm holding mixed emotions. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one is called Embracing the Silence. Whenever you step fully into the present moment, you let go of the need to know how things will turn out. Your attention is on the only thing that you can know. What is happening now? The most authentic response to a situation arises from a place of spaciousness, of silence, of not knowing. You can't plan everything in advance. You can't know what another person will do until she does it. If you can't tolerate not knowing and the feeling of helplessness that sometimes accompanies it, you will miss much of what is happening in the moment. Silence is your connection to the source, the place from which new creation springs forth. What I found interesting about this chapter is that um, another book we've done is called Gifts Differing by... Mm -hmm. um, Isabel Myers Briggs. Briggs Myers. Briggs Myers, thank you. And um, within the Myers Briggs framework, I identify as both an introvert and a judging type. So for me, what that how that manifests is that I really like my alone time. Mm -hmm. You know, I like my what I thought would be silence time. And I also like to know where I stand, which means that I can be incredibly decisive. I tend to make decisions, you know, and with a negative edge, I tend to make decisions before I necessarily have all the information that would be useful because I just, I need, again, it's a control thing. Your I want resolution. to be, I want to be resolved. I want to know what I'm doing, where I'm going, who I'm doing it with, where I stand in regards to other people, situations, etc. And I want to have everything decided, resolved. Um, and what I found really interesting is that A, this chapter is quite a challenge to that need to feel resolved about everything. And also she gives an example in it of silence. And she says, um, when you're at home, for example, on your own, do you have the TV on in the background, the radio on in the background? You know, are you 
do you have background noise? And I was thinking about it and thinking, actually, yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. I really like to have music on. I love music anyway, but I just like I like to have something on in the background, whether it's an audio book or music or whatever. You know, I really like that. And it really made me think about that because, again, like I said, I identify as an introvert. I like my quiet time. I like my alone time. Mm. But actually, it's not that quiet. Right. <laughs> and at that, it really made me think about how I feel... I assumed that I was okay with silence, but actually it really made me feel about what my relationship with silence is. And um, again, just going back to um, some of the counselling training that I did, we talk a lot about silence in there and how as a counsellor, especially in the beginning, you might feel the need to fill the silence, Mm. but actually that silence is really, I mean, the way way she puts it is it's where new creation springs forth but that's where um, silence sometimes is more helpful than dialogue yeah yeah I I think there's sort of two things coming out of that one is um, to do with what you just said in terms of dialogue with others Um, when you're having a conversation uh, and not kind of filling in filling in all of the silence to stop yourself feeling uncomfortable and she gives an example of of, um, her dad was apparently used to interview people on TV or something and she gives an example of him asking a question and then immediately answering it before the the guest could answer it and she says she sort of sees what her dad was doing that he he was obviously trying trying to control the conversation to get something he could work with in the interview but the point being that he was worried that if he just asked the question he didn't know what kind of response he would get, and that was anxiety provoking. Mm. And she's making the point that in conversation, genuine, authentic conversation includes space yeah. and bits where people are trying to work out what they think and feel, and it's you know it's taking a little bit of time, and that you actually have to leave that space rather than jump in and fill it with kind of blah 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 blah, <laughs> you know. And and so I think. There's that aspect, which is to do with how you relate to others and whether or not you try and control the conversation, as you put it, by filling the silences. And we all know what that feels like and what it looks like. Like I think I can do that, and I also know what it feels like when someone else is doing that to me. Mm. You know, when you, If you're having a conversation with someone, we were talking about a conversation this morning that I had with somebody recently where I wanted to express something, and every time I would say one sentence of what it was that I was expressing, the other person would just talk and talk. Mm, mm. And I didn't really feel listened to, you know, because there was immediately, like, a whole commentary on everything that I, uh, came back on every sentence that I was... So I didn't really... It's like watching a horse galloping off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and so that was sort of filling in. The, mm. Every small pause in what I was saying was getting filled in. And I know how that feels on the receiving end when, you know, when, when someone's filling in the silences. And I know also if I'm feeling anxious, I can do that. I can start talking in a conversation when there's a, a silence mm-hmm. as well. So there's that aspect, which I think is really helpful to do with interactions with others. And the other aspect is the first thing that you talked about, which was to do with inside one's own head. Yes. And I think there is, you know, I like, I know how you feel. Like I... I like to feel like I'm using my day and I'm productive. Yeah, in, uh, she actually re- talks about that. Yeah, exactly. Like, and I want to feel like, okay, well, if I'm going to do some, if I'm going to do the washing up, then I want to also be listening to an audio book because I, that's more productive. I'm doing two things at once. It's a bit more productive use of my time, right? I'm definitely relate. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and there's a joy in that. There is a joy in feeling productive and in in getting things done, right? But I think she's also talking about. Is it also that you're not comfortable with just being with yourself and letting feelings and stuff come up, letting thoughts bubble yeah. up? And that, I think, is a very good question. I did wonder, because she actually directly referenced being busy, and I know that's something that I feel a huge amount of pressure sometimes about. Like, I really, there's part of me that gets a huge kick out of being busy, and I feel productive and, frankly, you know, worthy when I'm being busy because I'm pro- producing things, I'm doing things, I'm knocking things off my task list. And I I mean, it feels a bit silly to say this, but there's definitely part of me that feels like a better person when I'm doing that. Mm. And um, 
And I know that's a very kind of false self thing in the sense that it's, that is, again, a condition of worth that it's, you know, I was taught that it's good to be busy, it's good to be productive and achieving, and if you're not, you're lazy. And so I really struggle to be, quote, lazy. Of course, it's not lazy, it's just, you know, it could be sitting with your feelings or whatever. And it's interesting because when, when I'm not doing that, for example, just to use the example you gave, if I were to do the washing up and not listen to an audio book or not put on some music and sing along, or you know, and either turn it into productive learning time or fun downtime, I would feel like I was wasting that time. Mm. And that would be very anxiety-provoking for me. Yeah. Well, not very, you know, not very anxiety-provoking because it's washing up, but it, I would definitely feel yeah. mildly uncomfortable about it. So yeah. I, reading that really made me... And it, that's not something that I had been particularly aware of before because obviously when you have this belief that it's really good to be busy... You you want to feel good. <laughs> you want to you want to feel good as much as possible. So I would just think, yeah, I'll flick on an audio book, and I wouldn't even think twice about it. But reading this chapter made me think, actually, what am I what am I doing with that? What What's my purpose? Yeah. I guess that's the yeah. question. What is the yeah. intention? What is the intention? <laughs> Bring it back to the other thing. Yeah. And I guess that I I don't have much more to say about that, but there was one thing that I wanted to mention right at the end, and I I think this brings us nicely to that point, which is a great quote that she includes right at the beginning of the book, which I think really encompasses what we've been talking about here to do with um, how some of the suggestions are very much an internal process and others are a mixture of an internal process and an external process. And she says right at the beginning of the book... You can only be as authentic as you are self-aware. And I think that's the biggest takeaway from this book, which is that it it's, in a sense, the goal is not to be authentic. The goal is to be self-aware. And, authentic, you know, if you, if you want authenticity, you don't get that by, quote, being authentic. You get it by being self-aware. Mm-hmm. And I, I really appreciate that way of looking at it, and I can definitely see how how true that is because ultimately if you're not if you're not aware I mean obviously not everyone no one is 100% self-aware we all have things going on that we're unconscious about that we're kind of blind to that perhaps other people can see but we can't see in ourselves or whatever but um, it is a process and I think it is very very true that the more self-aware you are the more authentic you're able to be Absolutely, absolutely. Great, well, unless you have anything else to say, I think that's quite a good note to end on. Yeah, I, I really recommend it. It's a great book. Um, it's something that I've found very useful to read. Oh, she also has a card game that I, I yeah. really want to try, actually. Yeah. You can order it from her website, but it's... Um, I can't remember how many questions, maybe 200 questions or something, or, or something, like, something that. like that. But it's basically a card game that you can play with people, and the whole point is to develop your authenticity and your intimacy with people. And these, it sounds quite fun. Yeah, these cards contain a mixture of questions. Um, I'm trying to, I looked them up on her website, and I'm trying to remember what they were now. But some of them are quite mundane, or like, I don't know, what is your favorite color? And other things are, or what was the last holiday you went on, and other things are a lot deeper, but I, I really I really like the idea of that. And even if I even if I don't order the card game, because we're traveling light at the moment, maybe I'll make my own version. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Great. Well, the next book is Six Pillars of Self-Esteem by Nathaniel Brandon, which I have actually already read a while ago, and I highly recommend. It's a really, really thought-provoking book. So I hope you'll join us for that. It's on May the fifth, the May the fifth. That's a Sunday, and it is at three p.m. EST, which is twelve p.m. Pacific time. So I hope you can join us for that, and I look forward to seeing you then. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. You can get in touch with Hannah by emailing H-A-N-N-A-H at becomingwhoyouare.net. Don't forget to visit becomingwhoyouare.net and find out how you can use rational personal development to live an authentic life.